Next, we're pleased to have Dr. Stephen Koslin with us today, who is President and Chief Academic Officer of Foundry College. Let me briefly introduce Dr. Koslin, although it might not be brief because he is such a well-known uh, scholar, so there might be something more than we expect. We, uh, he went to UCLA as undergraduate and to Stanford as a grad student, was at both Johns Hopkins and Harvard for some time. He's a psychologist and neuroscientist whose research specialty is mental imaging, and he's an expert on science of learning. He served as Dean of Social Sciences at Harvard, as a director of the Stanford Behavior Sciences Research Institute. He's well known for designing the pedagogy and curriculum of the Minerva School, which remains the most innovative and selective of universities, and it requires no further introduction. Today, he will give a talk titled Active Learning in the Digital Age, which will be the main part of his book uh, in press called Active Learning Online, the five principles that make learning come alive. And he said this will be the first time to present on, on the book. So we're going to be the first people who hear about that book. He was supposed to uh, join us in real time, but due to unexpected matters, uh, we met him in advance and record his session and question and answer as well. So now I would like to share that talk with you. And we also gave him a couple of questions and kindly provide answers for us. If we are ready, let's hear it. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you for being willing to listen to a recording. Um, I wish uh, I could be there in person, but uh, these days it's very difficult to be many places in person. Uh, so work that uh, we do have electronic technology, which I'm going to be talking about later. Uh, technology is actually very useful. So I'm going to talk about active learning uh, in this digital age. You can use technology. Next slide, please. So active learning is vastly more effective in traditional lectures. That's why I'm Next slide, please. What is active learning? Next slide, please. Using information, so for example, in a debate or problem solving, some way of using information, in the service of achieving a learning outcome. So a learning outcome is the point. It's what you want them to learn. So it's not just a discussion. It is. That's what active learning is. Many forms of active learning. Debates, playing, and dozens of different types of things that you can use to help students. Next slide. So the reason is very effective. Take my word for it. Here are the results from a meta-analysis, an analysis of 225 studies of active learning compared to traditional lectures in science-related fields. Let me read this slide. It says, the studies analyzed here document that active learning leads to increases in examination performance that would raise average grades by half a letter, and that failure rates under traditional lecturing increase by 55% over the rates observed under active learning. Finally, the data suggests that STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, math, instructors, they begin to question the continued use of traditional lecturing in everyday practice, especially in light of recent work indicating that active learning confers disproportionate benefits, helps even more for STEM students from disadvantaged backgrounds and for female students 
in male dominated fields. So the data show active learning actually works better, leads students to learn better. And that's especially true for women in male dominated fields. Next slide, please. So why is active learning effective? Next slide, please. It's because of how the brain works. That's why active learning is effective. Next slide, please. The science of learning, an enormous amount is now known about how learning, and by that I mean the encoding, the taking in, and storage, getting it into storage, and memory, and by that I mean the retention, holding on to it over time, and retrieval, digging it out when you need it, work. So learning and memory are really different sides of the same coin. You can't have learning, really, without memory. If you learn and you don't remember, you might as well not have learned. And you really can't have memory unless you learned it. They're really different aspects of the same thing. That's what science of learning is about. It's a huge amount of information now known from studies, thousands of thousands of studies of how learning, memory, organization, various related functions operate in the brain. Very little of that knowledge is systematically used in education, especially online education, which is what I want to focus on now. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about five principles. So I've organized the literature into these five major principles that I believe account for almost all of the effects of active learning, why it is, it is so good. <clears throat> so let us go through them one at a time. We'll start with deep processing, which I think is the most fundamental. Next slide, please. So if we were in person, I would try to do this demonstration. But since we're not, I'll just describe it and ask you to simulate in your mind, to pretend what it would be like to be in the demonstration. So usually there's a big audience and I ask people to form pairs. So each person starting from the end, turn to the next person, you two are a pair, and then the next two, you two are a pair and so forth. And then I say, okay, number two here, the person on the left of each pair from their point of view should decide whether each word in a list I'm about to show you names a living thing or not. So if you saw the word tree, you would say yes to yourself silently. Yes, tree is a living thing. If you saw rock, you'd say no to yourself. No, rock is not a living thing. So that's what the person on the left is doing. The person on the right of each pair will look at the words as they're printed and decide whether each word has a taller letter at the beginning then at the end, so look at that word house. The H is taller than the E, so that would be yes. We look at that word mouse. The M and the E are the same height. The first one is not taller, so that'd be no. Or look at most. T is actually taller, so that would be no also. So the question is, is the first letter of the word taller than the last letter? Okay, next. So I ask people to raise their hand if they've gone through the entire list, so I know. Next slide, please. So here's the list. Let's go through it. Pretend you're the person on the left who's asked to judge meaning, um, whether it's living or not. So frog, is that a living thing? Yes, it's a kind of animal. Harp, which is a kind of musical instrument, is that a living thing? No. Rat, is that a living thing? Yes. Okay. Personal left goes through to themselves silently classifying each word as to whether it names a living thing or not. Now, person on the right, take that rule. Imagine that you were the person on the right. Now, frog. So you look at the word as it's printed, and yes, the first letter F is above the last letter G. It sticks up higher. What about harp? Yes, the H sticks up above the P. What about rat? No. The R is not taller than the T, and so forth. 
Okay, next slide, please. So I have them go through it and then wait. I wait for like 10 seconds or so. And then I ask them to recall as many words as you can that are on the list. I give them about 15 seconds. So they call, they can write it down if they want to, or they can just remember them. Next slide, please. So now I say, look at the list again and count how many words you collect correctly recalled. So they're gonna score themselves. It's the honor system. Next slide, please. So they see the list again, they go through and score how many they were able to recall. Next slide, please. Finally, in each pair, I ask them to look at each other and compare the number you got right with the number your partner got right. And to raise your hands, if the person on the left, who judged living, non-living, got more correct than the person on the right who judged whether the first letter was taller or not. Next slide, please. Typical result, I've done this dozens of times now, many more people, typically it's about 90% or more, of the room have their hands up. That is, they're, they're reporting that the person on the left, who judged living, non-living, got more correct, they remembered more, even though they weren't trying to remember, than the person on the right. Why? Next slide. Judging whether a word names a living thing requires more mental processing than judging surface properties, the way it's printed. In order to decide whether it's living or not, you have to remember whether it's an animal or a plant or whether it moves or eats. You have to do more mental processing than just looking at what's in front of you and making a judgment on what you see. Next slide, please. Principle of deprocessing. The more mental processing one performs on information, the more likely one is to retain it. This is why if at the end of the day, you're about to go to sleep and you think about what happened during the day, you can remember a lot, even though you didn't try to remember it when it was happening. You can remember a lot because you paid attention and processed the information. And the more you processed it, the more likely it is you remembered it, even if you didn't try to. Next slide, please. Content-specific deep processing. It's also called transfer-appropriate processing. What you remember depends on what you process. So one study, actually there's been several, will have people go through a list and either decide whether each word rhymes with another word, listen, paying attention to the sound, or decide on its meaning. And then later, they're given a cue whether it rhymes with something or eating. It turns out that the effectiveness of the cue depends on what they were oriented towards in the first place. That is, what they remember depends on what was processed. So if the beginning they were asked to process sound, they would remember sound better than meaning. If the beginning, phase one, they were asked to process meaning, they would remember meaning better than sound. So it's not that meaning in general is better than sound. It's really what you focus on and process. What is remembered depends on what is processed. That's critical. Next slide, please. So active learning exercises in teaching should direct students to focus on learning objectives. So a learning objective is what you want them to learn. A learning outcome is what they actually learn. You want them to have learned specific learning objectives. Next slide, please. Let me give you a rather complex example, which works very well online. You really can't do this easily in person. It's an example of where it's actually an advantage to teach online. So it's a multi-phase role play to learn a negotiation strategy. Next slide, please. Let me go through this. So negotiation, one aspect is called the BATNA. B-A-T-N-A. -A. It stands for 
best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So this comes from a book by Fisher and Yuri called Getting to Yes, Two Harvard Business School Professors. Um, in this case, we use, um, we teach them, we, we spend 10 minutes giving them a lecture, telling them what a BATNA is and what the qualities are of a good BATNA. A good a BATNA is like a backup plan. So if negotiations don't work, it's your backup plan. So it should be something that's feasible. It should be something you can get buy-in. It you, uh, doesn't want to cost too much, various things like that or characteristics. So we teach them that, 10 minutes. If, if that's all we did, they would forget it in a few days. So instead of just giving them a lecture, we follow it up with some active learning. So in this case, it's a role play. So it's a water rights negotiation role play. There are four roles. So they're the farmers who need water for their crops. There are homeowners who need water to take showers and wash dishes and water their lawns. There are the environmentalists who try to minimize the amount of water use, save water. And then there are the engineers who have to figure out how best to get water. So there's four phases. First phase, there are small groups that have four students in each. Each group represents a single stakeholder role. So there's one group just for the farmers, another group just for the environmentalists, so forth. In each group, they know about the other three, and they know they're going to have to negotiate soon. And they devise a strategy for negotiating, including a BATNA. That's phase one. Phase two, after 10 minutes, new groups are formed, that include one representative from each of the previous groups. So now we have a new group. It's got one person who is representing farmers, one represents the environmentalists, one represents engineers, and so forth. And they do a simulated negotiation, role play. And their job is to try to figure out what the badness are of the other stakeholders and evaluate how good they are. Phase three. After another 10 minutes, they go back to the original group and they report what they learned, what they think they learned about the badness, the other groups. And finally, phase four, they go to the class as a whole and each group is going to summarize one of the badness and that group that actually came up with the badness will verify whether they got it right or not. Next slide, please. This is much, much easier to do online. For in Zoom, for example, you can use spreadsheets to set up breakout groups in advance. So it's not that hard to start off with the phase one groups where they're each homogenous and then move them to a second phase, we reassign them. You do this with spreadsheets, much easier than trying to do this in a classroom. The key though is incentives and consequences lead students to process the relevant information at every phase. The point is to get them to learn about badness. So you want them to focus on badness and what makes good badness. Can I have the previous slide? Go back one slide, please. Uh, don't go back, please. Yes, thank you. So in that first phase, they know you're gonna have to negotiate soon. So they pay attention to learn the strategy and their own badna, which is what you want them to learn because of the incentives. They know they're gonna to have to represent their group and they don't wanna look bad in their fellow students. That second phase, they're now motivated to try to learn the characteristics of the other group's badness because they know in the third phase, they're gonna to have to report back. And then finally, in the third phase, they know they're gonna to to report to the class and they are be verified. So in each of the phases, we used incentives and consequences to focus them, to have them process deeply the relevant information for the learning objective, which is to learn about BATNA. Next slide, please. So deep processing, critical. It really is probably the core principle for active learning. Get the students to pay attention and process the information they need to achieve a learning outcome, to learn what you want them to learn. Deliberate practice, second of these principles. Next slide, please. 
So deliver practice, learning is enhanced by paying attention to feedback and using it to update one's knowledge and subsequent behavior. So here's a classic case. I taught in France for a year. I wanted to learn the language, so I hired a native speaker to be my tutor. So I would say a word, and she listened, and then repeat it back the way it should sound. The accent was proper. I would listen to what she said and compare it to what I said, and then I would say it again, trying to minimize the difference, trying to be more like her. So that's deliberate practice. You don't just say it over and over again. You pay attention and try deliberately to improve based on a model. In this case, the tutor was the model. Next slide, please. The challenge is using deliberate practice online at scale. It's easy to do with a tutor one-on-one, -on -one, but doing it with many students in a class is more difficult. This is, again, something that's easier to do online at scale. Next slide, please. So let me give you one example. I'll give that again because we just did it. Next slide, please. First, you have them produce material behavior. So next slide, please. Example here is breakout groups, small groups, say four in each, would create a BATNA. Now they'd write the BATNA for a specific scenario. So they're just for the farmers or just for the engineers or whatever. So this is a different kind of activity to get the same learning outcome we talked about. Next slide, please. Now they note the differences from a model. Next slide, please. So the example in this case would be breakout groups receive an example of a good BATNA from another scenario. You don't want to give them the same one or they just copy it down. They have to note the characteristics like it's feasible, it's cheap, and so forth, identifying ways to improve their own. Next slide, please. Then they revise their BATNA to reduce the differences from the model. Next slide, please. So revise their BATNAs to have characteristics more like those in the model example. Next slide, please. They receive feedback on the revision. Next slide, please. Now you take two groups and you pair them automatically and make a bigger group. And you have each of them use a rubric, which is a way to score things, to evaluate each other's BATNAs. So one group will present their BATNA to the other. The other would then evaluate it using objective criteria, like how to evaluate whether it's feasible and so forth. Okay, and then re finally, they revise, reduce the differences from the model. Next slide, please. So we group some re revise or bad notes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the challenge was using deliberate practice online at scale, and you can do it by using models that you can distribute, rubrics, which give them objective ways to evaluate, and peer feedback. So you can do this at scale with many different students uh, online in a way that's actually quite hard to do in person. Next slide, please. So dual coding. Next slide, please. So the principle of dual coding, learning is more effective. The material is presented as both words and images. Next slide, please. So you want to illustrate and describe key facts, concepts, and procedures. So it's not just showing pictures. You can also do things like this, where this is a mind map, it's called, where it's showing and telling. So a mind map, look in the upper left, it's an overview, easy to memorize, simple, fast, and fun. Those are the benefits, and so forth. So you can see the mind map technique here has been used to illustrate and describe the characteristics of a mind map. So dual coding, about showing and telling. Next slide, please. Asking students to produce mind maps has the added benefit of drawing on the principle of deep processing. So you can combine dual coding by having them produce something or search the internet for something, for it, something that causes them to have to process deeply. Combine that with this dual coding. Next slide, please. 
So remember about content specific deep processing, transfer corporate processing. This is where if you pay attention to sound, you remember sound better than meaning. If you pay attention to meaning, you remember meaning better than sound. What is remembered depends on what was processed. That's why incentives and consequences were so important with the multi-phase role play was to get them to pay attention to the right things about patents in that case. So dual coding should lead students to process deeply two different sorts of information. Turns out that parts of your brain that are involved in perception, the vision, hearing, whatnot, are also involved in memory, visual memories, auditory memories. Those are different from language areas that are, will store verbal, verbal information. So dual coding can get at least two different kinds of information stored, two different memories. So it will give them two different ways to remember it later, really improve memory, really improve learning. But you have to direct them to pay attention to both what is shown and what is told. Next slide, please. So chunking. So this is another demo I would do if we were in person. I think some of you have seen this already, so it wouldn't work anyway. But um, if you'd seen this for the first time, pretend you had, and let's go through it. So you'll soon see a series of letters. Please try to memorize each letter in order. Okay, go ahead, please. So I show this for maybe five seconds. Take it away, please. Okay, how many letters can you recall? And raise your hand if you recall more than nine letters. It's almost one does, a few people maybe. And then I ask, can you raise your hands if you notice the groupings? And he, it turns out whoever was able to remember it uh, was able to do so only because they, were, they did notice the groupings. Then I say, now look for three-letter acronyms of famous organizations. Next slide, please. And now look for three letters that are sort of the symbol, the shorthand name, and acronym or famous organizations. How many letters can we call now? Next slide, please. Raise your hand if you call more than nine. Usually most of the room has their hands up. And then I ask, did you notice the groupings? Everyone who has their hand up noticed the groupings. Next slide, please. So these are the groupings. So there's two ways, these are called chunks, which are groupings of smaller units. There are two ways you can do it. One is bottom up. You vary the stimulus property. So here we vary the color and the spacing. So they're grouped because of the color, common color. So BBC, they're all green. KGB, they're all blue. They get grouped by common color. And we've also used proximity, it's called, where we group together and have spaces between the units. That's bottom up. We can also do top down, which is you use stored associations, which is what we would have done in this case. Um, so you can organize your teaching materials using the principle of chunking. Learning is easier. The material is organized to three or four organized units. Critical thing, each of those units in itself have three or four units. So my favorite study on this was done by Anders Ericsson and Bill Chase um, at Carnegie Mellon University. What they did is they asked a student to come into their lab, one student, and sit, um, I think it was an hour session, for three times a week, for a year and a half. Three times a week, for a year and a half. And what they did is they read him digits, and they asked him to repeat them back. They started with just one, they said, okay, two. And he could repeat it back, he said, two. Then they said, all right, how about five, nine? Uh, every digit, uh, one a second, five, nine. Then how about one, six, seven? One, six, seven, repeat it back. They'd add an additional digit till he couldn't recall the entire list. It was eight digits long. And the first day, only recall eight, that's normal. They kept bringing him back. By the end of a year and a half, he could recall 79 random digits, one per second. Amazing. How could he do that? Turned out he was a long distance runner and had run in many marathons, long distance, and he remembered the times. 
for different segments and different races and so on. And what he was able to do was take the digits and organize them into time. So if you heard 1427, you might think uh, 14 minutes, 27 seconds. Oh, yeah, that was pretty close to this part of halfway through some marathon or something. He would use associations to um, previous races to organize the material. And the trick is, for each segment, he could then organize higher groups of segments. So he's able to, at each level, have only three or four units, but those units in turn were organized up. Next slide, please. You can also use it as a professor to organize your lectures. So this a common problem with going online is you have a lecture you taught traditionally and it's not going to work if you just read it into a camera. It's going to be like 1910 when you took a movie by filming a play. Just filming a play is not very compelling. It doesn't take advantage of what movies can do well. You can get off the stage. Similarly, you can do a lot better than just reading a lecture into a camera. So in order to do that, what I recommend is first identify in lectures where you asked an exam question, where you assessed. So go look at your exams, go back to your lecture notes and identify where you answered the questions. Because that's whatever you have in your exams is what you thought was most important. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking about it. So identify those, and then group those into chunks, conceptual chunks. And then basically eliminate everything else because you didn't think it was important enough to test it. And you can insert active learning material after the chunks. So you have, again, you'd have usually probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes of lecture where you have a learning objective. You're giving them a set of related things. And then have active learning, like a role play or a debate or something else, so they'll actually learn it. So you can use chunking as a way to help you as a professor organize your lectures and get them focused on what's most important and then emphasize that in active learning. Next slide, please. Finally, building associations. So let me read you this. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient, depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere due to lack of facilities, that is the next step. Otherwise, you are pretty well set. It's important not to overdo any particular endeavor. That is, it is better to do too few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications from doing too many can easily arise. A mistake can be expensive as well. It actually goes on a little longer than that, but you get the idea. One group was given this and just asked to try to remember it. Another group, next slide please, was given a title. They were told it's about washing clothes. So if they knew it's about washing clothes, they remember far more than the students who did not know what it was about. Next slide, please. Principal associations. Learning is enhanced by associating new information to what is already known. Next slide, please. So uses of associations, in learning and memory. So one, organizing during encoding. So I've emphasized this about the use of associations and chunking. So associations can be used to organize lots of things and make them manageable so you can remember them more easily, store them more easily. Second, storing information effectively by integrating it into prior knowledge. So that's what the washing clothes example really shows, that if you know how to associate it to what you already know, it's going to be much easier to remember it. And then retrieving information effectively by associating good retrieval cues. So do any of you ever have a problem learning the name of someone you just meet? Um, I regrettably do. 
and I learned a way to help. It really helps a lot. What I'll do is um, when I meet someone, usually they have a name that I know somebody else with that name, a Sam. I know three people named Sam. So what I'll do is I'll look at their face and I'll think of a particular Sam I know who looks sort of vaguely like them. And I'll try to find features that, like their eyebrows or their lips, their nose, something that reminds me of that other person with the same name. And I'll study that. And then later, when I see them, I scan their face and it, the features are going to remind me of the other person who has that name. So I, I can build in retrieval cues in the memory by associating those features that will help me remember the name. Next slide, please. The classic, so different contexts provide different cues. This is one of the main reasons why spaced learning works. So it's well documented that learning and repeating it over time is much better than just doing it all at the same time, cramming it's called. So you're much better off studying a little bit at a time than just doing it all the night before the exam. Why? Because every time you study in a different context, having done something differently, different time of day, different place, you have different cues that will help you remember it. Next slide, please. So classic experiment that shows what happens when you don't have different kinds of cues. Uh, I love this experiment. It's so clever. Uh, God and my dad, they did it. They had participants learn words either sitting on the shore or while in scuba gear. They're all divers, scuba divers, 20 feet underwater. So they tested the participants' memory for the words either on land or underwater. So you learn it on land, and you're tested on land or tested underwater. You learn it underwater, you're tested on land, tested underwater. What they found is participants recalled about 50% more words when they learned and recalled the words in the same situation. So they had the same retrieval cues, same associations. So switching contexts where they didn't have the associations, much poor recall. So you want to build in as many retrieval cues as you can. That's one of the reasons the spaced practice is so important, studying in different contexts. So important. Next slide. A way to do that with active learning is you would revisit the same learning objective, maybe in combination with a new one, very common in STEM where it's cumulative, and you vary context by using different types of active learning exercise. So you might have them do a role playing for BATNA, like I did at the very beginning, and then you use this deliberate practice technique where you, you produce something which I showed you secondly, very different retrieval cues or debates, problem solving, evaluations, perspective shifts. Uh, there are many, many dozens uh, in the book that I've written about this. I have dozens and dozens of examples of, of active learning techniques. Uh, there's a, the last chapter, which literally goes through the summarizing. Next slide, please. So, science of learning, an enormous amount is now known about learning, that coding and storage, bringing it in. And memory, retention and retrieval, hanging on to it, bringing it out. Very little at all is systematically used in education. It should be, especially in online education. Next slide, please. You can summarize the science of learning in terms of these five principles. Deep processing. The more you pay attention and think something through, the more likely you are to remember it. But you'll remember what you focused on. So you want to focus them on what's important. You have to have clear learning objectives, you design activities that will focus students on the relevant information for them to get the learning outcome you want. Deliberate practice, you need feedback. We, uh, learning is actually best when people make errors, make errors and get corrected. You can design online activities where you have students correcting each other using models and rubrics. Dual coding, uh, both show and tell. Focus them to process both kinds of information. They'll have more information stored, better chance of being able to learn it. Remember it later. Chunking, you want to organize material, so no more than three or four units. You can do this either top down using associations or bottom up. You can do it not only for the teaching materials that you have, but your lectures, how they're organized, 
and how you organize them so you can have the electric components feed into active learning. Finally, associations. You build associations to help them both code it, get the information in in the first place, retain it, and then be able to retrieve it, dig it out later. So all of this, all these principles can work together. They often do in the service of helping the students learn, which is really what this whole thing is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Koslin. Um, thank you for accepting our very um, challenging request. And then you did perfectly, really well, um, even though it was a second time. But actually, it was even better, maybe because I heard that first time, and then actually I remembered better, maybe. <laughs> so uh, uh, let me uh, ask um, three questions for you. Um, so that we can let you go soon. I mean, even though we have like six or seven questions, I'm going to kind of organize them uh, it's into okay. three. Um, it's, it's, I'm, okay. I'm happy to have questions on okay. here. So. <laughs> okay, can I start? Yes. So I got some uh, questions from some you know, faculty members, uh, including me, after we saw the, you know, some shortened versions of your um, presentation and then now I'm hearing it uh, maybe we can add a little bit but let me uh, start with maybe three questions first number one uh, in the offline classroom it is hard for a professor to monitor students and make sure that all have an equal chance to participate fully in discussions or activities what are the advantages of the online classroom for ensuring that all students have an equal chance to participate? So I guess it's more about participation. I, I understand. So I, the, one of the big advantages of online, and you can do this both synchronously, like on Zoom, and asynchronously, where this I discussed this in the book I wrote, ways of doing this, is to have uh, small groups. So you set it up so that students will meet perhaps half of the time uh, with three or four other students in a well-defined activity and uh, interact with each other and then bring back as a group to the class. So that is a way to be able to have very large numbers of students have a more personalized experience and be able to get feedback. So I gave an example of where you can pair groups and you use rubrics and models to have them give feedback to each other. And then of course, uh, you can always have a group call on the professor to visit the group if they have a problem. So I've, we, I've done this for many years at this Minerva and I've done it at the Foundry College, works very well. So the students don't have that much interaction in lecture, um, but they have a lot in the breakout groups. Thank you. Um, that actually uh, is related to uh, one of the questions. Since you mentioned the synchronous, asynchronous, why don't I um, go to the related question? Back in the early 2000s, um, people had very lively interactions on the internet in asynchronous formats as you know. And so in designing active learning courses, is there any true advantage in the synchronous online learning rather than asynchronous learning? There, there are a few. There are a few. There's probably less than many people think. But uh, one of them is how quickly you can give feedback. So if students have a question, they can get it answered quite quickly. Whereas asynchronously, they have to type it into a bulletin board or some kind of a shared doc and the professor may not look at it for hours or maybe even a year or two. I hope not, but that may happen. So feedback is a big one. And then some kinds of activities, not all of them, some kinds are easier to do in real time than um, via uh, shared documents and so on that people are visiting asynchronously. So it's really about the, the, the time between events, if that's important, 
then synchronous is going to be better. But not all activities require tight time linkages. There, there are many types that do not, actually. Very good. Thank you. Um, like, yeah, actually, in the spring semester, we, you know, everyone had to try online uh, class. And actually, that was one of the issues. That, you know, we are giving real time uh, lectures and we are trying to have discussions. And then sometimes, well, it's kind of hard for students to like synchronously uh, participate. So, what are we going to do? So, you know, there are lots of two uh, things to think about. Um, let me uh, ask something related to active learning. Your definition of active learning orientates um, teaching toward the learning outcomes. Does this mean that objectives of an active learning course will be different from those of a traditional lecture-based course? Do you think it would be there would be different objectives, or would put probably the same? I, I it, well, it should, in my opinion, it should be the same. I mean, you should have a clear set of objectives, probably no more than three for any given lecture. Uh, and those should be the focus of active learning. They should be the focus of a traditional lecture. I mean, that was the point. You wanted them to have learning outcomes to, to leave the lecture knowing certain things. But active learning is going to be more effective because it draws more effectively on those principles about how the brain works. You know, active learning is going to involve a lot more deep processing in particular, as well as an opportunity for deliberate practice and so forth. And it's just very hard to do in a lecture. But the learning objectives, they should be, they should be the same. Um, I think active learning requires you as a professor to think about the learning objectives in a way you don't have to do with a lecture. With a lecture, you can just repeat a lot of facts you can just go through a lot of material and not really think clearly about exactly what is the objective. Whereas you cannot really do that with active learning. You have to think clearly about what the point is, what you want them to get out of it. Thank you. Um, our last question um, has to do with five principles of the science of learning, which are the main uh, things that you presented today. Um, let's assume that a course designer has followed um, the five principles of the science of learning you uh, talked about today, but um, nevertheless finds that the learning outcomes were not sufficiently reached by students. What are the best practices for improving the outcomes for future classes? So the first thing you have to do is find out why it didn't work out. So lots of different possibilities. Uh, one is simply level. Uh, you may have pitched it too high, so they don't have the prior associations to be able to organize it and take it in. You may have pitched it too low, so they're getting bored, they're not paying attention. Uh, so they may lack the, the right. You may not have motivated them uh, appropriately. So they just don't care, they don't know why they should learn this stuff, why it's interesting, and so forth. I mean, there are many possible reasons why they may not have learned it. So you, you can't begin to fix the problem to understand what the problem is. So that is the very first step. Um, once you diagnose the reason why it didn't work out, it's actually pretty straightforward to then turn around and use those principles. The principles are about form, not content. So you can use them well or use them poorly, depending on the particular content use them to present. And the content that's appropriate really depends on your students. It depends on what level they're at, what they already know, what their motivations are, and, and so forth. So there's, there's no one way to use these principles. You can certainly use them which won't be useful. Um, but if, if, you, if you do use them and you use them um, in a way that is calibrated to the students, uh, it's going to be more effective than if you don't use them. Thank you so much, Dr. Koslin. Um, we would love to have more uh, lively discussions, however, um, you know, given the time limit and also
since we have to let you go. Okay. It's uh, getting late in your time. So thank you so much for your presentation. And I'm, I'm looking forward to reading your new book on the you know, things that you talked about today. And thank you so much for answering all the questions today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you in the future. I look forward to seeing you too. Thank you. Um, thank you.